Thank you so much, Carolyn. It's a true delight to be here. I always love talking about art um, to people. It's beautiful, you know, even if I don't, what I have to tell you isn't that great. You've got something wonderful, fabulous eye candy to take in. So uh, today uh, we're going to explore Eucharistic and Good Shepherd slash sheep symbolism in religious art. Um, most of the art that I'll be showing you, despite the opening slide, but most of it um, will be from the late medieval, early modern period, in part because that's my er period of specialization in terms of my academic background, and also because during that, those centuries, um, the human figure was prioritized as a vehicle of meaning and the human figure represented in a naturalistic way. And so it present, that presents special challenges when it comes to um, pointing to Eucharistic meaning, but also uh, great opportunities, great potential for saying something that's truly profound about, in terms of theological meaning. I'm going to try to draw out the theological meanings in these pictures and we'll strive to show how they both teach and stimulate the viewer's love and devotion, that they work in, on both levels, on the intellectual and on the affective level. And that's why I personally think that uh, religious art can be a great catechetical tool as well as um, a focus for devotion and, of course, for appropriate um, decoration of ecclesiastical spaces. Now, as all of you know, texts are usually privileged in catechesis, but from relatively early on, there was a perception among Christians that pictures could be valuable, too, in teaching the faith. And in fact, there was a, a lot of debate in the earliest centuries of, ch of the church about the appropriateness of religious imagery. There were uh, some reluctance to turn to religious imagery initially, in part because of the mosaic prohibition against the use of idols. And in the uh, world of pagan antiquity, uh, idols were large figured, figured statues in temples, and so they were very imposing, and you know, people thought they embodied the god, and there were uh, grave concerns about uh, encouraging that kind of devotion, which would have been inappropriate. But um, early on, uh, the very fact that God becomes incarnate in the person of Jesus of Nazareth gave warrant to the idea that indeed you could depict God become human and his human life, as um, uh, written about in scripture, through images, through the use of artistic images. And Gregory the Great, in uh, the Pope in around 600, in fact, wrote a very explicit defense of the use of religious images. And I'll just outline the three, the three justifications that he provided, because they're important and they're ones that still are, are used. That they could effectively teach people who could not read that they would be a good substitute for text because, of course, in, in those eras, in the pre-modern eras, the vast majority of the population was illiterate, uh, that they provided good memory aids, that it's easy to remember a picture rather than words, especially maybe a boring homily. <laughs> and finally, that they could stimulate devotion to an emulation of Christ and the saints that pictures have the capacity, if they're well done, to arouse our empathy, our identification with the, with the person in the picture, and uh, to make us appreciate their suffering and uh, desire to be like that. Uh, the images that I'm going to show today touch on the dual Eucharistic themes of Christ as shepherd and paschal lamb, as priest and victim, and as giver and gift. And I basically grouped the, the slides because I, I wanted to show things that I thought you, at least a significant portion of them that you might not be familiar with. Uh, so uh, there, there's kind of an assortment of things, but I think they, they come to he together coherently. I hope so. Anyway, we'll start with some Good Shepherd imagery in the earliest centuries of the church. 
uh, then uh, explore Eucharistic motifs and scriptural allusions <coughs> in scenes of the infancy of Christ, uh, then look at uh, passion scenes, specifically the Last Supper and deposition of Christ from the cross and the Eucharistic elements in those pictures. Uh, and then finally, at some unusual images uh, that have Eucharistic um, motifs in unexpected ways. And then finally, circle back to uh, the representation of Christ as the Good Shepherd in the modern era. So, we're going to start uh, with um, these two works. Um, both from the early centuries, the, the figure on the left, um, it, which is an independent, now independent uh, figure of the Good Shepherd with his sheep on his shoulders that uh, was detached from a an late antique sarcophagus uh, burial tomb um, that's now in the Vatican. And then above it, um, the engraving, uh, of an engraving plaque from a, a funerary monument uh, that shows at the bottom a relatively crude engraving of Christ as the Good Shepherd, again, bearing the sheep on his shoulders um, with, in a grove of trees with sheep around the base. Um, one of the hurdles uh, initial hurdles to the appropriation and ad adoption of imagery in Christian belief and practice was the very fact of the crucifixion. Uh, it was the most humiliating and degrading, most painful way to die in the late antique world. And um, Christians were mocked, in fact, by uh, uh, people in antiquity for their belief in a God who's crucified precisely because that's like an oxymoron. A God who is powerful would never undergo and suffer crucifixion because it's such a, an awful, uh, revolting way to die. And so that's, that's a tough sell, right? It's not a good brand image uh, to put out there. And so there was some reluctance to show, to represent the crucifixion as a central image uh, of Christian devotion and belief. And as a result, there was an, instead an appropriation in this instance of a late antique figure type, or actually it went back into the Hellenistic era, of um, this shepherd bearing a, a ram uh, in antiquity on his shoulders and was used in pagan religious practice as a kind of votive figure that uh, worshipers would bring to a religious site, a temple, and leave sort of as a memento of their presence and their devotion. Uh, they're bringing a, a sacrificial offering to the temple. And Christian artists appropriated that, that image type uh, to represent and to allude to uh, the various scriptural passages that speak of Christ as the Good Shepherd, that speak in, in the Old Testament in terms of a shepherd who cares for his sheep, who leads his sheep to rich pastures, in this case the rich pastures of eternal life. Um, here Christ, you know, carrying the soul uh, to these bu this bucolic paradise um, that is heavenly existence. Um, in, we can see, especially in the little sculpted figure, that the, the figure of Christ is beardless and youthful and handsome. In fact, he's modeled after uh, an Apollonian type. The god Apollo uh, was a young, handsome youth, uh, and therefore a, type, a figural type that would be very appropriate for Christ, unlike you know, now we think of, when we think of a picture of Jesus, we think of the, a bearded, gaunt, be relatively gaunt, bearded man, um, mostly uh, influenced by a Byzantine, the Byzantine tradition. And uh, the god of Apollo was also a god of reason, and that was another reason why, and that, and there, um, what is rational, why he seemed to be an appropriate figure type to bring in and adapt to represent Christ.
Here's another famous mosaic, now slightly later, in what is called the Mausoleum of Gala Placidia, so a funeral chapel, although we're not certain that, uh, in fact, it, it served that function or not. It's uh, attached to a church in Ravenna, in northern Italy. Uh, Gala Placidia was the daughter of the Roman emperor, and um, she was uh, an, a significant patron and also a very powerful woman in the empire. Uh, and she commissioned this building, had it decorated with absolutely stunning mosaics um, uh, that are still intact quite miraculously. Uh, you can see uh, this lunette mosaic, mosaic on, the, on the top there of Christ as the Good Shepherd, uh, seated in a pasture with beautifully rendered uh, sheep gathered about him. Um, you know, you think of that passage from Isaiah, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the uh, lambs in his arm. All that, all that kind of scriptural imagery feeds into this amazing mosaic. But we see in this case, again, the figure of Christ is given though, that Apollonian kind of uh, visage and is also dressed in imperial robes, the gold and purple of the imperial house. And in this case, he wields his staff, which is surmounted by a cross. So in fact, he leads uh, through his crucifixion. Uh, that is how he, he, he tends to his sheep. Uh, it's important to, to remember, and uh, I, I wish we could make this room even darker, but right, right off the bat, I should note that we see all these works of art now under even illumination. And that is very deceptive because until the later 19th century, works of art, pictures, were experienced through flickering lamps or candlelight. And that entirely changes how you see them and how transporting they are because we know that uh, electric light gives you a steady even illumination and whereas a flickering candlelight makes you aware of the sort of ambient atmosphere and especially in the case of a mosaic which is uh, composed of small little glass tiles which have a highly reflective surface and in this case a lot of gold leaf behind at the back of the glass creating the color of Christ's robe and the various um, little gold elements around it, that the, each tile is set in at a slightly, just a slightly different angle so that when illuminated by flickering lamplight, the light bounces off all these separate tiles and creates a truly a ethereal kind of experience. So you see these pictures as, in a really, in a, as in a visionary way, they're, they're alive in, in effect. And we also see, and I included that uh, um, view of the ceiling and various architectural elements here within this uh, funeral chapel, because uh, to indicate how rich uh, the decoration is and also that it's got a lot of floral motifs, vegetal motifs, uh, the acanthus leaves, grapevines, obvious Eucharistic symbolism going on there, um, stars. So that's the whole cosmos in effect. The artist is creating the illusion that um, the whole cosmos is contained in this space. And when you would exit the funeral chapel, this would be the, the last image you would see. So it's a very um, seductive and beautiful visual memory to have and to carry with you in terms of looking forward to one's death and the, the, uh, what, what comes after. Yes? Of the society, who would be experiencing this? Is this something that would be restricted to the wealthy to come into the chapel? Yeah, this, this is the imperial family probably. And oh, yeah, imperial. yeah, yeah, that, you know, there's, all religious art of this period, it, it, the art, it, it's expensive, right? You know, the uh, art of this kind, you, you pay, have to pay a lot for the high quality artisans to do this, right? And the materials are very expensive. Um, and it's used as a way to consolidate and proclaim power in terms of imperial or aristocratic patrons. And at the same time, it's also the fact that you are taking material wealth and putting it in something that doesn't earn 
money. You know, you're not, you're not putting in the stock market, but you're setting it aside and for something that has no functional value in this life. It's at the same time a, a, a sign of devotion. Yeah, any other? Oh, the imperial pallium, the, the purple stole. Okay. Also, it's starting over his shoulder. Yeah, it starts over his shoulder and goes out, extends over his thing. Um, so, uh, we've seen something of, of the late antique world, and now we're jumping ahead many centuries to the mid 15th century. The, you know, sort of center of the Italian Renaissance uh, with this um, center panel from an altarpiece painted by Domenico Ghirlandaio. This was right after he painted some of those uh, frescoes in the Sistine Chapel in Rome and he came back to Florence and took this commission. And speaking of wealthy, the family that commissioned this, um, what the man was the manager of the Medici Bank in Florence. So there was lots of money, which is interesting to me because um, didn't choose an adoration of the Magi, although that part of the episode is uh, of the early life of Christ is apparent as developing there in the upper uh, left uh, road coming down the Magi or advancing down the hill but instead chose the adoration of the shepherds as uh, the pr sort of want part of the principal subject. The principal subject, of course, is the Madonna and child. And um, he, here he shows the infant Christ, a, an adorable chubby baby there uh, with his fingers uh, stuck in his mouth like a baby does, um, uh, lying naked. On the ground. This is middle of winter. Everybody else, is, even the shepherds, are reasonably well dressed. Um, that's significant. You probably all know that, very familiar from Christmas cards, and may, may or may not have ever reflected on why that is the case. Why do we show a nearly naked child uh, lying in, not in this case, he's before the manger, which is meaningfully a classical sarcophagus uh, here. So this is. Um, the child who will triumph over pagan Rome, pagan imperial Rome. That's what all that um, sort of the ruins of antiquity apparent there in those columns that hold up the roof of the stable in that empty sarcophagus. Uh, the grandeur that was Rome, in fact, is supplanted by the new kingdom ushered in by the birth of this divine child. And so then, and then the nudity of the infant Christ is one way to make very clear the reality of the incarnation, that God has become truly human in this adorable, naked, fully male child. Uh, you can notice how the child opens up his legs. That's another feature, uh, dis displaying his genitals. This is truly a human baby. And uh, you can see, too, that the, I mean, one of the challenges with infancy scenes is the most important figure in the scene is the smallest, a baby. And if you're um, working in a naturalistic kind of artistic style and you want to have an appropriate grade, gradation of scale, that means it's occupying the smallest space. Well, a way to cope with that, artists do, and, and wanting to preserve the, the luminous uh, pale flesh of this beautiful baby is to contrast that with very rich, deep color around uh, the child so that there, you have that high contrast of light and dark and then draws your eyes immediately to that passage of light, luminous flesh of the child. Well, the luminosity, obviously, the association of light with the divine. And typically, too, the child's pale white flesh is matched by the Blessed Virgin Mary's pale white skin. You notice here that in this painting that the shepherds have ruddy complexions. They've been out in the fields. They're sunburned. Uh, but uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary and her child have, the, have, these be have this beautiful, white, luminous skin. Uh, and also her gorgeous blue mantle uh, that gives a real solidity and strength and falls into that kind of cone-like pyramidal shape that gives a real um, 
solidity to her figure and occupies a lot of space within the picture. Her mantle extends under the child and goes over a sheaf of grain that he rests against. So we, obviously the grain has a Eucharistic reference. Literally the, the pale white flesh and uh, silhouetting it against these kind of dark elements is meant to remind us that the person whom we encounter and consume in the Eucharist is the same baby here, you know. So using that whiteness of flesh is, and whiteness of the, of the host, which is also a very small visual element in our experience of the Mass, constantly drawing together those two things so that we get the connection. She adores the child, um, the shepherds coming in at the from the right, you can see how they're arranged so that our eye travels down that grouping of shepherds through the pointing hand of the one uh, near the foreground that's extended through that garland that, again, using a flourishing vine idea to connote this kind of um, fruitfulness of this moment. It's also a clever uh, device by the painter. Ghirlandaio means garland in Italian, so he's proclaiming his work as the creator of this picture. And uh, St. Joseph behind, looking up in the sky, uh, he's wearing, uh, has a, he has a mantle that is that passage of sort of orangey yellow. Uh, St. Joseph often wears that, that color. Yellow sometimes has uh, very negative connotations as a color that's uh, typically sometimes of um, Jews who are meant to be understood as villains in uh, medieval, late medieval painting. Um, we see the continuation in you know, the Yellow Star of David that was used in terrible ways in the 20th century. But uh, it was also understood, this orangey yellow, understood as combining um, the red of justice, associated with justice, and the white of compassion. And that's the identity and, and sort of characteristic that uh, theologians at that time thought as important in St. Joseph that he combined qualities of justice and mercy uh, in his uh, willingness to marry the Blessed Virgin Mary and raise this child as his own. And he looks upward towards that light in the sky. Um, the scriptural language speaking of the Messiah as the, the birth of this, the son of justice. That's often, that's part of Advent uh, liturgy too. Uh, that's often a motif in uh, these kinds of nativity paintings. In the foreground, uh, you'll see right by the sheaf of grain at the child's, towards the child's shoulder, there are sort of bricks there, russet stones, like the earth color of the shepherd, uh, the stone that the builder rejected. And there's a little goldfinch in the foreground. Uh, European goldfinch have a, like red faces. And there was a legend at the time that a, when uh, Jesus was on the way to Calvary, uh, a goldfinch swooped down from the sky and plucked one of the thorns that had pierced Jesus' brow. He plucked it from his forehead and this, a splash of blood, you know, splashed back in the bird's face and that's why the goldfinch has a red face. So it's a, it's a passion symbol there. And also goldfinches were like pet birds tip, often of, of, uh, in, in this period for, for children, a child's pet. Uh, similar kinds of uh, imagery um, is apparent in this similar scene of the nativity slash adoration of the shepherds on the left um, of the 17th century. And we can see here how the child is wrapped in these brilliant white sw swaddling clothes that remind us the way that they're wrapped, both of the shroud pointing to his death and burial, and also the whiteness, the purity of it, reminding us of, of uh, uh, the altar cloth and the corporal. So that you know, pictorial insistence, the body of Christ that we encounter um, uh, uh, made present upon the altar. And uh, the child has a belt around his waist, which is sort of strange, but it's uh, probably derived from Isaiah 11, 
5, where he describes the, the rule of Emmanuel that springs forth from the stump of Jesse and says, um, he shall judge the poor with justice and strike down the ruthless and wicked. Justice shall be the band about his waist and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. So making those kinds of typological references back to the Old Testament. Uh, and again, uh, here we get a glimpse of the sun of justice in the distant sky, the dawn of the sun of justice. So those elements then, and a justice bringing, on, bringing about a rule where the proud and the mighty will be um, vanquished and the poor and the humble will be exalted. Um, we can also see here uh, how there's a sort of a woolen cloth behind the child, and it, the to tonality, the sort of working with beiges here and drawing together elements, meaningful elements in beiges. There's one of the shepherds who leans intently forward is wearing like a beige garment, and then there's a woolen cloth that sort of extends under the upper body of the child. It's also beige in tonality. Most importantly, the trust sheep in the foreground has that beige quality, and then the column behind that it rises up behind the Virgin Mary is also beige in tonality. Well, obviously the, the trust lamb that has come with the, the shepherds has, have brought and the sheaf of grain uh, before him are you know tokens of sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb here uh, realized in Christ's sacrifice on the cross and in the Eucharist, uh, the sheaf of grain again, uh, referring to the host. Uh, there's breads in the basket in the very right foreground there, right in the corner. And uh, the column behind the Blessed Virgin Mary is another symbol that um, represents the presence of God in this moment. This in particular is a motif that's associated with divine wisdom. This is the word made flesh, the logos and flesh. Uh, and it comes both because uh, the Temple of Solomon and, and the Book of Kings is, is described with this portico that has columns. Uh, and also refers to God's uh, presence uh, in the pillar of cloud and a fire uh, leading the um, Israelites out of the desert uh, into the promised land. Um, so all those things are, are th those elements, those scriptural references are also very cleverly integrated into this picture that reads as otherwise completely natural. So there's a, there's a great depth of theological and scriptural learning that's uh, implicit in this picture. I uh, chose the famous painting uh, in the inset thing uh, by Zerberon of the Agnus Dei, uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, he did, in fact, five versions of this picture, so it was very, it, it was very popular, uh, it had immediate popularity, and he quite masterfully captures, I mean, you would kind of think like, okay, uh, a tied up animal is going to look sort of you know, weird, right? It's not going to be much of a devotional subject, but he quite masterfully captures the, this. You know, humanizes the 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 sheep by giving you this sense of uh, complete submission, this willing submission of the animal. It's not it it's not risible. It's but it's you know arouses our empathy and the tr in this case the trust legs, the way that they form the a cross is, is obviously meaningful. Uh, another nativity scene, uh, Adoration of the Child by Botticelli, uh, where the artist now wanting to insist on the focal point as being the body of the infant Christ, and he actually Obviously, we know Botticelli is a masterful artist, but he deliberately tips up the body of the child, so we see the child sort of exposed in all his completeness, and um, does this beautiful passage of almost transparent veil that extends from the Blessed Virgin Mary's head and falls down and just drapes over the child's genitalia there, uh, uniting 
those elements. Um, in a way, it reminds, it brings to mind, and you, hopefully you won't hear the, the, the carol again, in the same way, uh, Hark the Herald Angel Sings, where the line, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. And indeed, you know, this is what we're invited to uh, contemplate in looking at this picture. Um, the veil is significant too. It's derived from the nuptial imagery in the Song of Songs, when the, that erotic poem in the Old Testament that describes the encounter between a man and a woman, two lovers, and the, the, the pursuit that goes on between them, and was read by theologians in the Middle Ages as an allegory of the soul's desire for God, um, the soul's union with God spoken of in these marital ter terms, uh, which, and further read as an allegory of um, Christ and the Virgin Mary, of the soul and, and Christ. So this sponsor sponsor imagery, also because it's so sensuous and powerful, you know, the erotic draw, uh, power of the poem is significant, uh, very adaptable to this kind of painting and used in many, in many different ways and, and very significant to the meaning of those elements like the use of the, of the veil of the, the Virgin that's also used, it's also a way to display artistic prowess and it's like a real tour de force to paint that kind of transparent veiling here that uh, reveals the child as, as fully human. Um, displaying himself, and again, that their, their pale flesh uh, is shared because, of course, the Blessed Virgin's uh, Mary's maternity is what guarantees uh, Christ's humanity. In a similar way, uh, that we see those um, marital motifs suffusing uh, we're going to especially look at the, uh, this delightful image by a Flemish, uh, from a Flemish workshop of the Madonna and Child. This is very tiny, six inches by nine inches, so probably a private devotional panel um, for, a, for a home, a home setting. And uh, we can see how he set this, uh, the, the Madonna and Child, in this uh, Flemish 15th century interior with the uh, located high up above the ground, a view, panoramic view outside the window. And the Blessed Virgin Mary again creating that stable, gorgeous, you know, passage of blue, like a pyramid of blue, very <coughs> solid, but at the same time enlivened by that, that, those amazing folds of her drapery. So it's, it's vivid and lively, and we have that sense of movement and the dynamism of this moment. But we're most especially struck by uh, the exchange of kisses between mother and child, um, derived and uh, inspired by the first verse of the Song of Songs, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, which was also assimilated to the reception of the Eucharist, that kind of a profound intimacy experienced in receiving the Eucharist. And we notice, too, the child's completely naked. He's fondling his genitals in this time, uh, perhaps a gesture referring to his, his imminent first wounding in the circumcision, which foretells the final wounding on the cross. It's significant that the child's body in that beautiful S-curve shape, which is you know, so unusual, is exactly aligned with the cross framing within the window. So we see where this is pointing to, to his death on the cross. And that, it too, is given a great deal of emphasis by the um, orthogonals of the beams in the ceiling that drive our eye into that space and make us look at that window. In um, the Blessed Virgin Mary, again, you know, if she is, she is uh, the figure of the church, the mother of the church, uh, She's like an altar in that bro her broad lap. It, it becomes like an altar, and she ho there's a, it's covered with a white napkin like the corporal in which the body of Christ rests. So all that is informing this picture. Um, there's the basin of warm water warming by the fire there. Um, again, uh, God uh, condescending to our humanity and uh, being born as a normal infant and undergoing um, 
the washing after his, uh, after his birth, even though he's perfectly pure and uh, no necessity for that. And a, a basket of what seems to be diapers in the foreground, again, another way in which God's merciful love condescends to our human condition and, and truly becomes human. In the background there, you see the uh, uh, fire blazing in the hearth, that large hearth, a reference to the um, burnt offerings, the Holocaust sacrifice, again realized on the cross, and a candle on the mantelpiece, Christ as, little, as the light of the world. So even in this tiny devotional panel that is, because of its scale, is so accessible and is something we immediately are attracted to and you know relate to and and you know feel like ah oh, that's beautiful it's adorable uh, you know it's there's all kinds of sophisticated theological meaning embedded in the picture that um, idea of the infant Christ and the identity between the infant Christ and the body of Christ made present at the altar in the Eucharist is also apparent in the scenes of the presentation, his presentation to the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, here, um, and oh, that's another thing I want to note too, because I see in the, the Ambrogio Lorenzetti painting reminds me of it because it's so colorful and he, he is such a master of this, this brilliant, uh, intense uh, pigments is that there's no magazine, no, tele, no color television, no photographs in this period, right? So, and, and all clothing is made by hand and requires, you know, shearing the wool, dye, you know, washing it, dye, spinning it, dyeing it, all that stuff. So in other words, it's a, it's a drab world in the terms of those kinds of material things that, you know, look at us, we're all in, you know, many of us are in brightly colored clothing and don't think a thing about it. But the colorfulness of, of these paintings is deliberate and it's something that would, be, would have been truly special to the viewer at the, in the, at the time where they were made. So, you know, they, they would have, I mean, it would kind of be like, you know, going to Disneyland <laughs> might be now or something like that. You know, a truly special experience that would be exciting and, and so visually satisfying. Whereas we have access to so much constant imagery, we must see thousands of pictures a day in our daily lives. We, we don't think anything of it. Well, you know, th that's, that's a very profound difference that m would have charged these pictures with a great deal of power and meaning that we find hard to access, you know, try as, as much as we might. So you notice in Ambrogio Lorenzetti's panel that the Simeon holding the Christ child has veiled hands like the humeral veil that veils the priest's hands when he's transporting the monstrance. Um, so again, that, you know, the body of Christ that he holds with his veiled hands same body uh, that's uh, displayed in the monstrance. And similarly, the Blessed Virgin Mary is about ready to receive the child back uh, in, in with her hands uh, covered in, in this white, um, white uh, with gold border cloth. So, um, and also the, this, this grouping and the way it's done in the, in the Ambrosia Lorenzetti painting, if you were looking at that and hearing the entrance antiphon for the Feast of the Presentation, it would have an image like this would have given that antiphon sort of new meaning. So the, the antiphon says, Your merciful love, O God, we have received in the midst of your temple. Your praise, O God, like your name, reaches the end of the earth. Your right hand is filled with saving justice. So receiving God's merciful love, that's what's happening in the temple here, uh, in, the, in, in the reception of the infant Christ. And then we see in the uh, little manuscript illumination from the small book of hours, though it's probably done uh, for uh, religious, you can see the monk in the background there, 
uh, that uh, it's even more explicit. The child is laid upon the altar and the Blessed Virgin Mary kneels in devotion before it, like Eucharistic adoration. Yes? Oh, she has a scroll that would be sort of, I, I don't know that the writing would, it was ever, you know, meant to be legible, but, but you know, this is like her, her proclaiming um, that the, the fulfillment of this pro the prophecy, this is the, you know, um, that, that she goes out for after, after residing in the temple for so many decades, and she has had the fulfillment of her desire there. So we can look at these other absolutely charming paintings. The Gerard David one is also, sm also a small little panel in the National Gallery in Washington. Absolutely exquisite in its color. And the Rubens, a much larger painting. But if you have a chance to go to the Art Institute, a spectacular picture. I mean, all of Rubens' delight and sensuality is is apparent there. Well, the Jared David shows us the, the rest on the flight into Egypt, and now you're familiar, the broad blue lap of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the way that her mantle is spread out, the fact that she sits on this flat stone sort of plateau like an altar, also referring to the, you know, the rocky hill of Calvary, and the Christ child in that beautiful little child's gesture of daintily taking the grapes from the bunch of grapes, obviously a Eucharistic symbol. And likewise, he's veiled in this filmy veil, you know, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. And uh, there in the foreground, a kind of picnic basket, the bread for the journey and the picnic basket. And the fact that this is the rest on the flight into Egypt, you know, also a reminder to the this is probably, again, a picture that would have been uh, displayed in a, in a wealthy household. A reminder that uh, attending Mass on Sunday is entering into the rest of God by re participating in the Eucharist. Uh, and so that kind of reminder of the relationship between the subject matter and the family's devotional habits. Rubens, um, again, you know, he ab absolutely delights in pa he he delights in, in voluptuous women and chubby babies, and he's a master at that at the treatment of, of that pinky white flesh of the mother and child. Uh, we can see that the Blessed Virgin Mary again is dressed in this intense red dress with blue sleeves, uh, red a color you know suggesting the passion. The blue has you know obviously celestial heavenly overtones to it. And her breast is bared. Um, the nursing Madonna, that is this kind of an emblem of caritas because nursing is a gift of, of oneself to the child. Uh, it demonstrates to the re truth of the incarnation that this is a child who needs sustenance to live. Um, and it's important to remember too that uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary is dressed in, in quite you know, it's in fancy clothes, like beautiful clothing. That cloth is absolutely stunning. Um, crimson dye was the most of that kind was the most expensive to procure in Europe. So, you know, no, nobility wore it, and it wasn't it wasn't no, normal at all for aristocratic women to breastfeed their children. That infants under the age of two were sent out to wet nurses uh, because you know. It, it, it was not the thing for aristocratic women to do. And so this is quite unusual, right? The, the, the viewer at this time would have recognized this gift of self in breastfeeding as being highly significant. And also, in the period, they, there was a belief that um, breast milk was made from cooked blood, you know, blood that had been warmed in the woman's pregnant body, and so therefore the connection between the breastfeeding and then the water and, and blood that uh, spills streams from Christ's side as the moment of the institution of the Eucharist, it tied together those elements again. So the, this, you know, the, the Virgin here is a figure of Caritas and a figure of the church are both coming together. Yes? Uh, two, hopefully quick questions. Sure. One, is that Joseph 
Hacking a tree. I mean, he's, he's oh, he's, he's got yeah. Yeah, he's 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 knocking down chestnuts from the tree, and it comes from uh, an apocryphal legend, where the the um, the trees, the palm tree on the flight into Egypt, bent forward to to drop their dates for the Holy Family sustenance, and it's a way uh, there a, a desire to show Joseph's significant role as the nurturer, as the pro provider for the Holy Family, that he's a pr protector and, and real true provider of them. And two, you see the, the donkey in the background, which is the means of transportation. We also remember that that's how Jesus enters uh, on Palm Sun enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And then this is the second picture of mm -hmm. the, the Jesus with the. Uh, an older looking woman, I think, with a, with a white band around her head? Yeah. Is, is that? St. Elizabeth. Here. Um, she's leaning on, and okay, there's this contrast. Rubens plays around with that, that strong contrast between light and dark. He likes that, you know, he creates that sort of slash, that diagonal passage of, of uh, mostly bare flesh extending from the lower left to the upper right, uh, terminating in, in, in the profile head of St. Elizabeth there in the corner. And she's shown as elderly. There's a contrast between light and dark, young and old there. Um, okay, so she's a, a daughter from a priestly line. And this is, and she's gazing intently. This is what, you know. The Old Testament has been looking so intently for this is the realization of all those prophecies in this child who caresses his mother's chin. That chin chuck, again, another motif, has uh, erotic connotations and derived from a sculpture group of antiquity of Cupid and Psyche. Uh, so that uh, an appropriated, often seen uh, between the Christ child and the Virgin Mary that's doing the chinchak. He's the bride. He's the bridegroom, and she the bride. Uh, so and uh, Elizabeth also leaning forward. You know that in the visitation, you know she's the first to recognize and articulate that Mary is the mother of God. You know how should it be that the mother of my Lord is coming to me? So uh, that she plays an important role and leaning against that Moses basket. Um, the Christ child is an altar Moses, the fulfillment of the law. He is the new law. And then we see the lovely John the Baptist eagerly, you know, uh, leaning into the child and, and gazing at the, the child and the relationship between the child and his mother and the lamb, um, the, you know, that's pointing, uh, whose foreleg is on John, resting on John the Baptist behind there that uh, St. Joseph sort of pets the, the lamb, you know, the, John the Baptist, as we know, is the one who proclaims, behold the Lamb of God uh, who takes away the sins of the world. And all that is telegraphed in this absolutely charming and beautiful scene. Um, another very small painting, about 12 inches by 6 inches. Um, uh, that is delightful too. I think that uh, Sophia Cavaletti's a book on the religious potential of the child. It, uh, she makes a remark about um, a parable as something that is little, little and therefore intriguing to a child, but that can point to something much greater, exemplify something much greater. Uh, uh, and uh, in a sense, this is kind of like a visual <laughs> um, realization of that kind of idea. Um, it's a small little picture and therefore accessible. It's gorgeous and very appealing to look at. Um, and yet it has this um, Madonna and child where the Virgin Mary is a giant, right? You know, like this is, she's in a Gothic cathedral, uh, you know, so she's the personification of the church. And she's like, 50 feet tall, you know, <laughs> if we assume this is typical of, of Gothic churches. And, and she's also wearing a jeweled crown that, that mimics the architectural finials of the, of the arches and things around her. So she is literally, you know, the personification of the church. And the Christ child there right in the absolute center, the little tiny baby, he's tiny 
even compared to her. But again, that uh, use, a very effective use of contrast, her rich, beautiful celestial bl blue mantle, and against that, that brilliant white of the swaddling clothes slash corporal that wraps the infant Christ. And he tugs at her neckline as though desiring to breastfeed, again, showing his dependence on uh, nourishment, uh, human nourishment, a truly human baby. He's also, if you look at it, the, uh, if you look at the bottom of the drapery, the, the tail of the drapery that extends, the white drapery that extends from his body to his head, he's the same size as the central opening of the choir screen leading directly to the altar. His body literally is like a key that gives access to the altar. Um, that's a very conscious thing. And uh, if you notice the, the way that the, the, the movement of his arm that tugs on the neckline of the Blessed Virgin Mary's dress and the way that she inclines her head towards the altar, that that directional line in, in, in turn points us towards the crucifix that surmounts the pinnacle of, of the altar. Do you see that? Yeah. So um, again, we see that... Uh, way of taking this Madonna and child and having it, it being used in a way, like a proleptic way, to point to uh, the um, end of Christ's earthly life, his sacrifice on the cross, uh, which is realized again in the sacrifice of the Mass at the altar. And this, uh, this beautiful light that enters through the cathedral, there aren't really stained glass windows there, that light penetrating glass like that, brilliant light, of course, light being a, a way of a talking about the divine uh, because it's immaterial and yet it, it light, you know, enables us to see. Without light, we can't see anything, so it enables us to see. And also light penetrating glass as being a metaphor for, for the virgin birth because it doesn't break the glass. It just, uh, the, the beams just come through the glass without, uh, and leaving it intact. Well, I, I, I thought since I was talking about Eucharistic themes that I had to show a Last Supper scene. <laughs> and uh, this is the central panel of an altarpiece commissioned by a confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament in uh, Belgium in the 15th century. Uh, it's the center panel. There were four, uh, four scenes on, uh, flanking it on either side, all Old Testament scenes and all ones uh, that were types for the Eucharist. So um, the gathering of the uh, man in, in the wilderness and um, oh, I, I forget what the other uh, uh, Abraham and Melchizedek the Passover feast the gathering of the manna and the Elijah in the desert were the subjects of the other panels um, in this last supper scene Christ is represented sort of as high priest uh, celebrating uh, instituting the Eucharist his speech act uh, indicated by his hand uh, blessing before the, the, the wafer that he holds in his hand is the exact visual center of the picture, so it's where our focus goes to. Uh, I spoke about the difficulty in the sense that the um, consecration of the host and its elevation in the actual rite is a visually small thing. Uh, <laughs> taking place in a big space, and, and how to deal with that in terms of making a picture. And this is one way to make that, that small thing, the, the host, uh, the center, the, the pictorial center of the picture, silhouetted against his dark robes, and uh, sort of backed up by that lavish white cloth that covers this refectory table that he's at. Um, you can see Judas in the left foreground there with his hand on his hip in a kind of defiant pose. Uh, Judas is on, on our side. He, he's in relation to us, so, you know, uh, a spur to contrition, an example of unworthy reception, monetary example to the person viewing this painting. Don't be like Judas. Uh, and uh, we see, too, that Christ is before this very large, a monumental fireplace and it has a wood paneling in the background, which is absurd, because if you had a wood panel background fireplace, it would be non-functional. Uh, uh, 
And uh, again, this reference to Christ uh, as the new Pasch, he's the new Paschal lamb uh, who dies on the cross. And in fact, the paneling, there's a cross shape that's um, apparent in the paneling. Again, we see that uh, prominent red porphyry column there at the right-hand side, sort of before the niche, uh, the uh, red column associated with divine wisdom also associated with uh, the column of the flagellation uh, where Christ is mocked and so uh, in effect uh, in, in Christ's passion and suffering, uh, divine wisdom is revealed and it, it is, appears as folly to the world as we know from the mocking of Christ uh, during his torments and his, his, in his incarceration. And we also see two figures looking through a little window and like a pass-through in the background by the fireplace. Those are probably inspired by a passage in the book of Sirach where the pursuer of wisdom, of divine wisdom, is spoken of as, and divine wisdom is personified as a fi female figure. And so the pursuer after wisdom um, gathers, you know, stays by her house and tries to peer through her windows to look at her so intently. And so that's these two figures, you know, in effect, seeking divine wisdom by looking through that little opening. There are also two standing figures in the dining scene at the back, and they're probably members of the confraternity. Oh, and uh, other Old Testament images in the lunette, uh, Above, above the doorway to the um, left of the, to the right of the fireplace uh, is uh, Moses with the tablets of the law. So Christ is the new covenant. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, as another kind of variant on Last Supper, Supper imagery, this is a small little scene from uh, a series of 35 panels that represent episodes from the Gospels that together all uh, made cupboard doors for a silver cupboard, cupboard in um, San Marco in Florence, the Dominican uh, convent in Florence. And uh, these were painted by Fra Angelico, Beato Angelico, a Dominican friar who was also a very gifted painter and uh, members of his workshop. Uh, these ha are 35 episodes from the Gospels, each of which is bordered by two scrolls uh, above and below with verses from the Old and New Testament. In this case, the upper inscription is from Ezekiel 39:17. The Lord God tells the Son of Man to say to all the birds and beasts here, and this is the quotation, I will provide for you a great slaughter on the mountains of Israel. You shall have flesh to eat and blood to drink. And the lower inscription than the New Testament um, realization of the type is uh, John 6, 54 from the Bread of Life, Life Discourse. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have eternal life. We can see from the way that Fra Angelico has um, composed the painting, again, he makes the figure of Christ administering communion to the apostles, the center of the painting, again, with two prominent columns in the foreground. And in effect, he, 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 by having, uh, showing the apostles kneeling uh, to receive and how Christ bends forward uh, to administer the bread, and that uh, he he sort of evokes that idea of the shepherd feeding his flock in a tender kind of way. Uh, it, this is a, a lovely little panel. It's, it's small and, and just part of, as part of a much larger group, as I mentioned. Yes? Yeah, uh, no, I don't think uh, there were, there had been, you know, there had been friars who, who traveled there and there were accounts of, 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 of you know, sites that they 
uh, pilgrimage site, so it's possible. It, this is a kind of a vault that's typical of Florence in this period. Uh, the, Ospitelli, the Hospital of the Innocents in Florence has a famous portico that was designed by Brunelleschi that has this kind of uh, vault vault structure so it would have been familiar and also San Marco itself has faults like this so it would have, it would have been familiar to him uh, locally. He was a, a professional painter who was an adult conversus to the Dominicans and uh, a very I mean one of the very best artists of the time in Florence and known to be so I mean a, an artist of extraordinary talent. Uh, and now a um, uh, scene of the lowering of Christ's body from the cross, again with this uh, spousal imagery, the kiss of the mouth shared between the dead body of Christ, which seems to be alive in death because uh, Christ seems to respond to the, the embrace of his mother, also the figure of the church she is. And again we see how this use of contrast, deep, richly pigmented garments, of the followers all surrounding this pale body that has lowered the bread that comes down from heaven that's you know lowered and raised again in the elevation of the host at the altar which uh, it's this is part of a large altar piece uh, that would have been placed at the back of the altar uh, before which the priest would stand and be looking at this so um, using that this kind of picture in a way that is meant to be kind of a scriptural gloss to what is happening at the altar itself. Who yes? Would be the male figure there? I mean, John, is the, the John, the faithful follower, and the, and the w female followers, and uh, John, John also, you know, um, holding the, the hips, you know, uh, holding the body at the hips. And then above, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, the um, to followers. I, I, I personally think, that, and, and I think there's very good evidence of this, that for uh, late medieval lame men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were very important scriptural models of service to the body of Christ that they, you know, sought to identify with. And in fact, in a slightly later period, we often see wealthy donors having themselves shown in the guise of Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea because when you think about the story of the life of Christ there's not there are not many figures in the story with whom a learned maybe wealthy layman can identify with you know there the the prosperous learned men in the story of the life of Christ typically don't come off too well, you know, like the scribes and the Pharisees and that. So it's, it, you know, to, to find figures with whom laymen could identify with, this is uh, the, the, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus provided very good models. And in particular, because Eucharistic devotion at this period is, is very, very strong and a desire to participate in that, you see the development of these confraternities devoted to the Blessed Sacrament and the like. Uh, another pairing of images showing, uh, wanting to show you how the infancy scene and Christ at the end of his earthly life are, are understood, you know, they're sort of bookends in a way and, and would relate to each other. Not that these two pictures would ever be seen, these two specific pictures seen in concert with one another, but that when you would look at a Madonna and child scene like Giovanni Bellini's, you would understand that the way that the child rests between her mother's his mother's legs, the fruit of her womb, uh, the way that he he, he's lying there with his hand across, drawn up across this ch his chest, his nudity. This is, um, you know, a foretelling of his death. Uh, and she is in devotion before that, praise before that. The vulture in the tree in the background, uh, obviously an ominous uh, figure, uh, you know, a symbol, an ominous symbol in this otherwise um, bucolic uh, landscape. And, um, in the case of the Jean Malouel uh, Pietà Tondo, 
uh, round painting, which the round form itself has Eucharistic connotations. Uh, we see how the dead, this extraordinarily beautiful dead naked body of Christ uh, with the blood of a side wound just trickling back towards his groin, the final wounding and the first wounding being united there, and how his hand responds again to the Blessed Virgin Mary searching um, gaze into his face and God the Father behind, the Holy Spirit extending from the Father's uh, lips towards the Son's head, uh, God the Father holding up his Son, the acceptability of the Son's sacrifice. So this is sort of a, a picture of the Trinitarian Godhead made present at the Eucharist. And uh, John the Evangelist, the beloved disciple, raising his hand there at the side in, in red uh, and, and weeping that, that this hand gesture like this, showing the palm of the hand, is a gesture uh, that connotes odd recognition of the moment, that this is you know, sort of a theophany and um, John's um, particular role because, of course, at the foot of the cross, he uh, becomes the son of Mary, and 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 um, so he has his uh, he has he's a, a privileged kind of disciple and a model for the faithful. You'll notice too that John the Evangelist here, the beloved disciple, is given rather feminine features. He's beardless. He's youthful. He's uh, somewhat prettified. Um, again. He is uh, seen as an, a model of sort of the Christian soul and in intimate union with Christ. Uh, on the left here, this figure group, uh, a small wooden sculpture group, probably made for a women's convent. This is a devotional group that was more common in women's communities of uh, St. John resting his head on Christ's breast. It was extracted from the la Last Supper scene, so I'm showing you a Last Supper scene there, uh, the fresco from a uh, famous chapel in, it in Padua in Italy by Giotto, that Last Supper scene in the lower right, and then I, I, show I picked out the detail of uh, the beloved disciple resting on Christ's breast. Um, we know from the gospel account, you know, um, John 13, 23, one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side at the Last Supper. And so uh, that, that, that f the group of two there is, is extracted to represent this, the intimacy of John to Christ, and an expression also of St. John's visionary insight into the Godhead that sort of suffuses the Gospel of John and also Revela Revelation. Uh, Sister Wendy Beckett said, uh, characterized this little sculpture pair in a, a, a really uh, appropriate way in, her, in a little commentary she wrote on it, and she said that Prayer is resting your head on the heart of God, and that sort of that's basically what what is you know shown here in this in this lovely little sculpture group. By the way, that tendency to show John the beloved beloved disciple in this kind of feminized, youthful androgynous male figure, that's kind of behind Dan Brown's crazy notions that it was Mary Magdalene <laughs> at the Last Supper in Leonardo's Last Supper, totally ridiculous, but in fact that, that, that was a figure type used for St. John and, and meant to connote those, those qualities as a kind of bridal soul to Christ. And uh, finally, I, I wanted to show, oh, I gotta get through this so we have a little time for questions. I wanted to show this unusual picture because it probably was, I mean, it's, it's no w work of great, great artistic talent, but it's interesting because it was probably actually painted by a nun who did a series of eight of these kind of painted drawings. Um, uh, either for herself or her community. So it shows 
um, the representation of Eucharistic desire and its fulfillment. So the nun is represented here as a personified soul that dwells in her heart. And she is presented by Christ, her bridegroom. He's, uh, as he puts his hand around her shoulder, and he presents her to the Father who's seated at the head of the table. And the dove of the Holy Spirit tips the chalice towards her as the Father uh, holds the paten in her direction. And in the background, her, just above her, her head, we see a, a little picture of the church, the, the Abbey of St. Walburg, where this... Uh, where Burga, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, where where uh, she lives, resides, and basically it's it's an image that shows the heart or the convent as the enclosed garden of the Song of Songs where um, the soul is united with God and the bride and bridegroom are joined together. And the scroll within the heart says, um, my most beloved companion, eat and drink and become drunk in my love, which is paraphrasing parts from the Song of Songs. He brings me into the banquet hall and his emblem over me is love. And another passage in the Song of Songs, eat, friends, drink, drink freely of love. So, uh, and it's also, there's, you know, references obviously in this kind of uh, picture to the wedding feast of the Lamb. There's also a scroll above the heart, extending above it, at the very top there, uh, that says, Here the ardent heart is nourished with the visitation of divine grace. So it's a very inventive picture, and it's theologically informed and sophisticated, and that's something that scholars have only you know lately become alert to in the use of uh, in images made uh, f for religious women how theologically sophisticated they are in fact yeah um, were they been, would she have been able to receive from the cup do you think in the convent i don't know uh, reception was was in we think infrequent and, and maybe all the more so because because of that, that, that nuns often would have even no visual access to the altar, that they would be enclosed in a choir and not, not even see the altar. So I don't know. And uh, now, wanting to get back to the Good Shepherd imagery explicitly, I thought it'd be interesting to pair these two. Uh, there is, aren't a lot of pictures that I could find by m contemporary artists. So I thought I would put together this uh, French Baroque painter, Philippe de Champagne, who was a very humble background, but uh, was a gifted painter and had many royal patrons, including Marie de Medici. Uh, he was a favorite of the French nobility and of Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, did a few paintings of this Christ as the Good Shepherd like that, with we know going back to the very earliest uh, figure that we looked at, the little statuette of Christ uh, holding the sheep over his shoulder. And uh, Philippe de Champagne, as is typical of painting this period, creates a sedate and very noble kind of figure of Christ, that, which has really gorgeous color. And um, then uh, Luis Jimenez, this uh, Good Shepherd painting, he uh, was a Chicano painter who died in a tragic accident. Uh, he had several significant commissions and ultimately was doing a large, more, more of a sculptor, doing a large a metal sculpture for the Denver airport. and. Uh, it fell on him, and he, he died of his injuries. It was a, a, a monumental piece. Um, and he was interested in commingling the cultures, of the, in the commingling of the cultures in the American Southwest. He lived in New Mexico, uh, died in 2006. So he often sets his work in south, the southwestern de desert, and here represents the Good Shepherd as a farm laborer among you know, holding a, I think it's a sheep. The other animals look more like goats to me, but I don't know. But it's interesting, very interesting to me, that in the, in the faded blue work clothes of the shepherd, he's preserving that blue coloration, right? And even in the, in the horizon, the orange and yellow, he's preserving that combination of those complementary colors that is so typical of traditional painting of this period. 
And finally, we get to the opening image, uh, which I like. I mean, I obviously it's apparent that I, I love a late medieval and Renaissance art, and I think it's um, has a particular capacity to combine uh, to, to appeal to us visually and also to be very uh, theologically sophisticated. Uh, but I don't. I, I'm not one uh, who thinks that, you, that it represents a golden age, that we need to create art that's just like that again. I mean, I think it's, it's much more sort of valuable if contemporary artists can try to work uh, and, and, and develop a kind of imagery and figurative style that will be meaningful and compelling again. And I, 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 Daniel Bunnell, it's not, even, it's not clear, in fact, that he's Catholic. He, he probably isn't. Um, but he's, a, he's a, I think, a very good artist. And uh, I think this image is, is, is quite compelling, uh, where the Good Shepherd now is like this figure of Christ on the cross, seen from behind, bending over, as though bending over his sheep. And I think it's very meaningful that the blue of Christ's body, I mean, it's like it, because we read that as a, as a void, as empty space, as pouring, the, pouring out this self-gift, being drained down, and, and how that blue of the body then becomes the, the lines that delineate the individual sheep. So how the life of the shepherd and the sheep are so beautifully unified in this picture, and uh, the kind of... Um, care of the, the shepherd and the self-sacrificial love, which is uh, powerfully conveyed in this painting. So um, with that, I will end my part. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to, to talk about it. If you want me to go back to other slides, if you have questions about particular images. But I hope you get a sense now about the, of the potential that these pictures provide for enriching people of all different ages, their uh, experience of the faith and their understanding of the faith and their love for it. So thanks so much. Yes. I just want to thank you. I never saw so much <laughs> in my life. <laughs> you really unfolded the wealth behind our uh, thanks. Thanks. helpful. Thank you. You know, for me, um, I, want, I, I don't know, I, and I haven't, I ha, I'm, not, I'm not good enough at analyzing text, but I, I have found it, especially the homilies of Pope Benedict and, and things that he uh, were published when, when he was just Joseph Ratzinger, he seemed to have a real visual sensibility, and I often find, I'm so, often so struck by passages in his homilies that it's like have turned the light bulb on for me it's like all of a sudden it's like oh that's what that painting must be about you know like I never so I mean if you ever want to you know do anything more there's so much that I you know often in his writing that will illuminate the meaning of some of these pictures and I think you know in my background as a scholar art historians typically will say their response will be to say Oh, well, can you find a text that, that says that that's what the artist was thinking of? And, and you're never going to find that kind of text because, as I, I hope it's become apparent, this is about um, snippets, especially in the liturgy, from scripture and liturgy, uh, that are in this cultural memory that then are informing how artists are thinking about these pictures because, you know, they're... they're they're working for learned patrons. Um, they're, obviously, there will be you know, a priest advisor, a theologian advisor, who is you know, giving direction in terms of not telling the artist exactly what to do, but having this sort of mutual discussion. Now how a, a patron would work with an architect, that kind of collaboration. And so, um, and obviously, those things are, are rarely recorded. I mean, you know, we, we do have a few contracts uh, for, for artists to get, you know, commissions where they're setting out in legal terms what's required to be represented in the picture that gives us a sense about which saints are to be represented there. But don't tell us much about how the composition is, never tell us about how the composition as a whole is to work. So I think it's like, 
you know, that in, my, in the academic world where they always want to have textual proof, you know, sh you know, show me proof, show me a theologian who writes about art in this way, show me a painter who ever knows this, you're not going to find it because it's sort of, it's something that's also artists are um, conquering, hending through orally through their experience. And artists, by this period, they would have um, uh, resources like the Bible, like uh, the Golden Legend, Lives of Saints at their, at their disposal, breviaries and the like, and they would consult those kinds of things in making paintings. Yes? A question. I don't, like, I don't know if this means anything or not. So last night we had a talk about how the loss of a shared memory, um, religious, cultural, leads to a fragmentation mm -hmm. uh, and, and that solidarity is if you were Okay. So, so just thinking about some of these paintings where like for example, the mosaic of Christ dressed in imperial robes. Mm -hmm. People would have just known, they would have seen it now, of course. Yeah. Look, I had no idea yeah. until you tell me. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, so, so there's an artist drawing on that shared memory that those who, they could have read and experienced the painting in a very different way. So now, in our age, where that fragmentation is more of a reality, it, what effect would that have on modern art where what, what, it, or does it even not? What am I sharing with, what is, what images are, does that fragmentation affecting the way we experience art? In a, in yeah, I, I mean for me, and, I, I, and what frustrates me, I'm, I'm often good at sort of seeing what the problem is, but not good at coming up with solutions, which may be, because I'm not an artist myself. But you know, there are a number of problems working now I don't think, there are very few artists now who are working in a style where the human figure is represented in a way that's very positive and that there's this per sort of perception that it can carry meaning in of itself. We, we see the human figure more often in pornographic contexts, right? So, and, and then to, you know, the, the abstraction that was sort of the priority in 20th century art, that art should be a sort of a completely cerebral experience and a very pro the expression of the, of the individual artist, his individual genius. Well, that all, you know, emphasis on the exceptional individual genius of the artist and they're creating something that's like sort of some sort of inspiration that's coming like a bolt of lightning. Well, that's not compatible with an artist working in a tradition that says that there are, there's this common body of faith, belief, and knowledge that is the subject matter, should be the subject matter of art. So, you know, so, so you could, I mean, uh, unfortunately now I think a lot of the religious art that I see created, it tends to opt for either a Byzantine style, <laughs> or which, which is wonderful in a way, but it's very, I mean, personally for me, it's hard to have a kind of emotional identification with it. It sort of arouses, you can admire the doctrine, but it's hard to, you know, cultivate empathy, you know, or a sense of identification. You can't, it's hard to imagine yourself going in and occupying spaces in, the, in, a, in a Byzantine painting. So, but it looks nice, stripped down and elegant and abstract. So people like, you know, religious people who like art will very often opt for Byzantine icons as the kind of art that they like. And then the alternative to that is something that looks more like kind of primitive child's drawings, and which has its limitations too, because again, the, the, the degree of abstraction inhibits the expression of deep emotion and uh, the arousing of deep emotion and identification, compassion. And so, you know, I, right at this moment in history, I think it's very, very hard. I mean, we ha there is a new movement of more traditional artists working in a more academic vein, but they tend not to appreciate the sensuality that is moving to people. And again, the sensual now, it's problematic in our world, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know nothing about art, but I did work in the, in the Mexican community. Mm -hmm. And I would wonder if, because they would carry more of the story still, 
and they are very emotional and their art is very sexual. Yeah. I would wonder if we wouldn't find more of that in Mexican mm -hmm. or Latino art. Probably. You know, most people when they see things like that, uh, Jimenez, um, Good Shepherd, they don't like it. You know, it's funny because people react, contemporary people, if you, if you make a religious painting where the figures are dressed like 20th, 21st century people, ordinary people, most people say, oh, that's not, that doesn't look religious to me, <laughs> you know that? And, and that's sort of one of the stunning things about art in the Renaissance is those are Renaissance costumes. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're showing, depicting themselves in these roles of, as holy people, you know. They're, and that's insisting, too, on the, you know, the reality of the incarnation, the reality of the life of Christ, just saying it's, it's still present, it's still applicable to you, you are there, you know, you are in the, at the crucifixion scene, you are in the crowd, you are at the nativity like the shepherds, you know, adoring the child. So it, it carries a really powerful punch and, and maybe you can do it in film, but most people, I, you know, when you, I, I, there was a, back in the 90s, there was a, a, an art professor at St. Mary's College who redid in a monumental scale uh, Masaccio's frescoes of the tribute money in the Brancacci Chapel in Florence. And, and he actually put figures, known professors, Father Ted, people at Notre Dame, he put them in the painting. So he redid Masaccio with same, you know, exact same compositions and everything, but with known individuals from the Notre Dame community and things. And at first, I saw a little postcard that advertised, and I thought, oh boy, is that ho hokey, you know, like really? And I went to it, and they, they ha it was installed in the Snipe Museum as though it was like the chapel space. It was incredibly powerful. I mean, it really was. And I just like it, it was revelatory for me because I thought like, wow, like now I got a sense of how 15th century Florentines would have responded to these paintings. It would be like your name, you know, this is real. And it's, you know, it's, this is sort of proof uh, of the relevance of, 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 of Christ's life and, you know, and that you participate in it. One more. I'm from Los Angeles, yeah. and in the cathedral there are tapestries, mm -hmm. and the artist is from a local city, and used his neighbors uh, in the images of, the, so you're familiar with, with uh, Yeah, I've seen them, but not in great photographs, like, so I, I, I know, I have a sense of how they look on the wall. There, it's, it's the only, it's the only church where the saints are looking towards the altar. Oh. So they're not looking at us, they're oh. looking with us. Yes. Towards the altar. And there's a couple of uh, images of um, some kids, one of whom has a skateboard, uh, that is, is part of that. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, I find it to just be very, uh, very moving yeah. and warms up the entire cathedral. Yeah. It makes it much more human. And there's just the natural delight you take in identifying, you know, people you know. It's like, you know, it's amazing to look at these things and say, oh, I know, that's, you know, that's Randy Coleman. He teaches Renaissance art, you know, <laughs> and then looking at these things. It was just like, wow, it, it was really stunning. Anyway, yes. Yeah.